on how freedom of expression and democracy are related to each other, uh, both how it is perceived and how it is regulated in the Nordic countries. Uh, and I have a spe special attention to Sweden, and that is not on only because I'm Swedish, it's also that the regulation in Sweden compared to the other four Nordic countries are very uh, different from, from the other countries. Uh, it is relevant also to talk about the Nordic as a un union, even though the regulation differs as the five countries have common historical roots and strong political, cultural and economic cooperation. And the Nordic model is a branding uh, used for uh, a lot of things. Uh, for instance, the common economic and social policies, as well as cultural practices within the countries. But also freedom of expression and the essential role of the media. It is perceived as formed in line with a specific Nordic model characterized as media welfare state. And that media welfare state embraces not only a compre comprehensive constitutionally protected freedom of expression in media, but also responsibilities in law and self-regulation, uh, professional journalists, media literacy, etc., etc. So, in short, the constitutional system uh, protects mediated expressions more than non-mediated uh, expressions, but also put obligations or responsibilities on media. And the reason for this uh, has to do with uh, what Dieter Grimm said before. Uh, the essence of democracy is that the power derives from the people and must be controlled by the people. And it is perhaps a bit difficult for the people to control the power, therefore media has been given this important role as a, a watchdog of the power. Uh, so, in the chapter, I start to elaborate on the link between freedom of expression and democracy uh, and uh, the de democratic rationale for freedom of expression is central to the system in all Nordic countries. It involves constitutional protection for a free exchange of opinion. Uh, but also access to public information, a strong emphasis on media as a watchdog, and a combination of a guarantee against state interference, as well as measures to promote a diverse public debate with help of the state. So that is, it is a mixture of what in an international context would be called both negative and positive free speech. The constitutional protection of freedom of expression goes back to the late 18th century. And uh, in the late 18th century and the beginning of the 19th century, uh, all the Nordic countries had these uh, kind of extensive uh, uh, legislation around freedom of expression. But today, today it is, as I said, only Sweden that has this. Uh, the Press Act adopted in 1776 in Sweden and Finland, because Finland belonged to Sweden at that time, expressed two rights, a prohibition of prior censorship and a right to official information, or as it often is called, access to public information. The prohibition of prior censorship was not total. Uh, several matters were unlawful to express, but the principle was acknowledged. And that principle has been uh, claimed as very important since then, even though the specific content or the protection has been uh, varying over time. And according to uh, several scholars in the Nordic context, the most radical thing with the Press Act was uh, actually that it became the words first right to information. Uh, so that was the most important thing, according to them. 
Freedom of expression and freedom to information are thus seen as two essential building blocks in democracy, and they are also prerequisites for the media in fulfilling its role as a watchdog and controller of the power. Even though the Nordic countries have a long partly common history of constitutional protection uh, of freedom of expression, the justification of it is, according to the political scientist Ulf Petje, taken for granted. When issues relating to freedom of expression are raised, he claims that it is, and I quote, it is almost always a question of its limits. Are some views unworthy of protection? End of quote. I think uh, Petter has a point here. Uh, and if you look at the legal scholarship in, in um, Sweden, for instance, in modern times, none of the few, very few doctoral theses on freedom of expression uh, address the uh, question of justification except that they refer to the wordings of the constitutional acts, which is to ensure a free exchange of opinion, availability of comprehensive and free artistic creation. Uh, and uh, Peter has an explanation for this that might be trustworthy, and then he refers to what is often mentioned in international countries, uh, the, the reasons for freedom of expression uh, by uh, Michael John, for instance. Uh, so in Sweden, where we have this very uh, long tradition of the constitutional uh, system, uh, we have not talked so much about the uh, justification of freedom of expression, uh, perhaps, or according to, to uh, Petter. But in Norway, uh, not having this extensive regulation today, uh, where the constitutional protection for freedom of expression was reformulated in early 21st century, the justification for freedom of expression was uh, addressed by the Norwegian Governmental Commission uh, um, focusing on freedom of expression. And the reasons for freedom of expression in Norway were expressed as seeking of truth, the promotion of democracy, and the individual's freedom to form opinions. And that, I would say, is more uh, similar to the uh, justification or the reasons that are used in an European context. While in the Swedish context, we have preserved the reason from the very start of the Press Act, uh, to be that freedom of expression serves the common good rather than it is an individual right. Uh, and this democratic rationale for free speech, uh, that it is for the common good, is uh, the most, most frequently considered rational within law in, in Sweden. Uh, what could be added to these reasons if you uh, look at the system and its uh, basic rationalities are uh, uh, accept this, the common good, uh, control of the power, as I said, the important right to information and in specific uh, access to public documents, uh, accountability uh, for the actors. Uh, transparent public authority, deliberative participatory democracy, well-informed citizens, professional journalists, and so on. And that goes in the same direction as I uh, apprehended what Adrian Stone mentioned. Uh, no, Martha Mino, sorry. Uh, this uh, looking at freedom uh, on freedom of expression as, as uh, much more than, or democracy, that much more than just the freedom of expression. And it's also this uh, view on the state as it has this enabling role. Uh, I also agree with uh, Peter that uh, when he claims that there is a risk about the, um, 
the consensus and not uh, addressing and not uh, discuss, discussing the uh, rationality of freedom of expression. Um, there is a risk that if we don't have this discussion that goes back to the justification, it is not that hard to resist uh, towards certain uh, certain claims for restricting the freedom of expression. So maybe that is also why in recent times, I think that the justification for freedom of expression has started to become an issue, but it hasn't been that uh, very um, obvious for many years. So, um, um, in the chapter, then, I um, elaborate on the long historical tradition and its originality compared to other jurisdictions, but I will not say anything about that now. And I uh, continue to elaborate on freedom of expression in the Nordic countries today, uh, how the um, regulation looks like, uh, and I have a special focus on Sweden uh, by the the reason that the uh, uh, the regulation is the most extensive and uh, it is unique not only due to age but also for the style of its how it how it looks uh, and also the constitutional protection uh, of media in specific so it is a system uh, in which noteworthy elements include the degree to which the approach differenti differentiates between non-media and non-media speech, uh, a strong protection provided to media sources, uh, rights of access to information held by public authorities, special procedural protections for mediated speech, which in practice means courts have only a minor role in determining, determining the limits of speech and the level of detail about speech in the constitutional acts themselves. According to uh, Thomas Bull, uh, one of the uh, well-known legal scholars uh, in this field, the constitutional regulation of free speech is exceptionally more detailed than in other countries, and that is his words. The system consists of no less than three constitutional acts. Uh, uh, the first instrument of government is comparable to the, uh, to the Article 10 in, in the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, no, the, the uh, European Convention of Human Rights, I mean, of course. Uh, but the other two constitutional acts are what is more interesting. They are uh, uh, protecting mediated speech, uh, using uh, media such as the press, uh, broadcasting, etc., uh, etc. Et so it's often said that the, the uh, two important constitutional acts in Sweden are technically, uh, the scope is technically decided. It is the medium, the kind of medium that is protected. And from start, everything produced within that medium, and at that time it was the press, everything was protected. But from 1949, uh, not everything is protected, but it, it all, it's also a matter of, of uh, uh, considering if the uh, mediated speech is in line with the purpose of the constitutional acts. Uh, so it is a matter of, of uh, putting limits around what is protected in several ways. First, it is a consideration if it falls under the purpose. Uh, secondly, there are some specific uh, exceptions mentioned in the constitutional acts, which uh, allows then uh, 
uh, statutory law to to uh, to uh, restrict or to limit or regulate in in certain matters. And also there are some other uh, specific uh, possibilities to to uh, regulate on certain issues that I I don't uh, elaborate on on now. So the limitations are decided in in uh, various ways. Uh, well, after the reflections in the in the chapter on the scoop and the applicability of the constitutional protection, I then turn to uh, the elements of the system protecting and promoting freedom of expression in detail. Uh, and I will not uh, do that now because I don't have the time to do that. Uh, after that, I will say something about the role of the court and the parliament and uh, what could be said about the, um, especially the Swedish system, but also the system in the other Nordic countries is that uh, the court has a minor role in deciding the scope of, of freedom of expression. Uh, we don't have any constitutional courts and uh, we have, of course, uh, as I said before, a, a special procedure when it comes to uh, freedom of expression uh, uh, cases. Uh, but the, the role of the court is, is quite uh, limited. Uh, and as I said in the beginning, the Nordic states are uh, claimed to have a special uh, media model, media welfare state. I will elaborate upon the media central role in the system. Um, because it is actually uh, the one of the main thing with the constitutional protection that it is actually the media that are that is protected. Uh, in the end, I will give an example of a debated issue. And uh, uh, you could call it a blind spot, as uh, there has been claimed by Thomas Bull, for instance, that there are some blind, blind spots in, in the system. Uh, and I will give you an example of one uh, such uh, blind spot addressed by me and Maria Edström in, uh, in an article from 2014. And that is how to deal with conflicts between two or more fundamental democratic principles. And the two principles uh, at stake here are freedom of expression and gender equality, or in legal terms, equal rights between men and women. And that has some uh, uh, thing to do also with uh, hate speech, as uh, some of you have mentioned today. So I will uh, elaborate upon that. And uh, after that, at last, um, uh, I will give some reflections on whether the Nordic model uh, could survive or not. And I point at several urgent challenges for freedom of expression and democracies today. Uh, freedom of expression is certainly under pressure as an individual right and also as a common good. And we know very well about state initiatives to restrict freedom of expression in, in many countries uh, and the claim to restrict freedom of expression are also present in the public debate in Sweden today. Uh, much has to do with hate speech, uh, at least hate speech when it's based on ethnicity and sexual orientation, but when it comes to hate speech based on uh, gender or sex, uh, it is uh, uh, the, stay, uh, the debate is very reluctant against doing something. So, so it's a very uh, complicated situation, but, but a lot of debates has to do with this uh, restrictions uh, um, regarding hate speech. 
but there are also other challenges that are important and I will touch upon them briefly. And that is that newspapers today are under pressure from decreasing revenues due to technological developments and changing media business models. New forms of collaborations emerge between editorial and commercial interests, resulting in advertising dressed as journalism, such as native advertising. Concerns have also been raised on the risks of media industry ownership concentration for freedom of expression, especially when it comes to the problem of, of one-sided views and agendas. Uh, and uh, in Sweden we have uh, public support for, for uh, press to uh, guarantee diversity and we have also a public service uh, with, uh, which is uh, funded uh, uh, publicly in, in, uh, in a certain way. Uh, and uh, both these subsidies and, and support has been uh, uh, challenged and, and uh, questioned. Uh, actually based on uh, competition law in, in uh, EU. So um, there are a lot of uh, challenges uh, uh, taking place uh, today that are important to, to be aware of. And at the same time, increased demands to strengthen the legal protection for commercial messages are made. Uh, and the traditional emphasis on protecting primarily political speech, even though we don't really uh, say that in, in the Nordic context, uh, it is extended to also encompass commercial speech, which, which is also a, a more uh, American uh, concept from start. Uh, in the US since long, but increasingly also in Europe, uh, not the least in, in Denmark, uh, not so much in Sweden yet. Uh, and these market driven challenges have implications for the infrastructure for freedom of expression. Uh, so um, I will then uh, finally uh, come back to the uh, consideration of philosophical foundation that I started with in the end. And I will reflect, make some reflections upon that and the need for, for a renewed uh, philosophical reflection uh, of the reasons for freedom of expression. Thank you very much.